Choma, you embarrassed me. You humiliated me in front of our in-laws. Do you have any idea who they are? Mama, you want me to marry a madman just because he's wealthy? She cried out, her voice breaking. How can you do this to me? Is this how much you hate me? That madman, as you call him, is Chief Ozoba's only son, she shouted. Do you realize what that means? Think about the world. Once upon a time, in a breathtaking African village, nestled deep in the heart of eastern Nigeria, there lived a young maiden named Njide. The village, surrounded by lush green forests, was a place of peace and beauty, and Njide's radiant looks only added to its charm. She was tall and graceful, her skin smooth and silky like polished ebony, shimmering in the sunlight. Her beauty was the pride of the village and the envy of many. Young men came from far and wide, bearing gifts of palm wine, to ask for a hand in marriage. Njide, however, had no interest in any of them. Each time a suitor came to her home, she turned him away, often in the most insulting manner. She would call them names, mock their humble lifestyles, and send them off with biting words. One unfortunate suitor, a hard-working palm wine tapper, faced her rot in a way no one in the village would ever forget. Njide, armed with a hot pot of water, chased him down the path leading out of her compound, shouting at the top of her voice, I don't ever want to see your miserable, poverty-stricken legs here again. Animal. Her angry screams echoed through the village, leaving everyone shocked. Njide was firm in her belief. She would only marry a wealthy man, someone who could give her the life of luxury she dreamed of. She didn't want a farmer, a fisherman, or a palm wine tapper, especially poor ones. She wanted a man who could dress her in the finest clothes, adorn her with glittering jewelry, and provide her with mates to do all the work. Her high standards worried her mother, Mbafu, deeply. Mbafo, a widow, who had raised Njide alone since her husband passed away, often sat with her hands folded, concern etched across her face. One morning, she could no longer hold back her thoughts. Njide, she called gently, her voice laced with worry. Are you telling me that out of all the men who have come to ask for your hand in marriage, not one of them is good for you. Njide, unfazed, replied, No, Mama, they are all poor. I don't want to marry a poor man. Most of them are fishermen, wine tappers, or poor farmers. Look at me now. Am I not beautiful? I deserve a man who can take care of me and give me the life I want. Mbafo was taken aback by her daughter's response. My child, she said softly, trying to reason with her. Money does not guarantee happiness. And a poor man today can be a rich man tomorrow. A good man who works hard and can provide the basics, food, shelter and clothing is enough. Remember, beauty fades with time, Njide. Your father and I didn't have much, but we were happy. But Njide shook her head firmly. Mama, I'm not you and Papa, and I won't live like you did. Don't you see Karo, Odogu's wife? Look at her clothes, her jewelry, her life. She doesn't go to the farm. She doesn't fetch water from the stream. She has made to do everything for her. 
and she even has a driver to take her anywhere she wants. That's the kind of life I want. Mbafo let out a deep sigh. Njide, my daughter, she said, her voice heavy with concern. Haro is lucky, yes, but not everyone is born with her kind of fortune. Do you know that Odogu didn't have much when he married his first wife? He struggled for years before the gods blessed him. Haro came into his life after he had already succeeded. A man you dismiss today as poor could become wealthy tomorrow. The gods work in mysterious ways. But Njide was unmoved. And that is exactly why I don't want to wait for a man to become rich. Mama, she said, her tone growing sharp. I want a man who is already made. I want a man like Odogu. Karo doesn't have two heads, so why can't I have the same life? She raised her hand in frustration, cutting off her mother before she could respond. Please, Mama, let me choose my husband. Don't push me to settle for less. With that, she stormed out, leaving her mother sitting there in silence. Mbafo rested her chin in her palm, staring blankly at the ground. A deep sigh escaped her lips as her heart grew heavier. She loved her daughter dearly and wanted her to be happy. But she couldn't shake off the feeling that Njide's pride and stubbornness might lead her down a path of regret. Njide paid no attention to her mother's advice, brushing it off as if her words were nothing but grains of sand swept away by the wind. She continued to drive away every suitor who came to her with humble offerings. Her mind set on marrying a man of great wealth and status. She believed her dreams were far too big for the simple men of her village. One bright morning, Njide's long-held dream finally came true. News spread that a wealthy farmer from a neighboring kingdom named Ndoka had arrived, seeking her hand in marriage. Ndoka was not just any farmer. He was rich beyond measure, owning vast lands and harvesting riches from the soil. He had heard tales of Njide's beauty, stories that painted her as a jewel among women. Intrigued, he decided she would make a fine addition to his household. He didn't come empty-handed. A large truck filled with luxurious gifts, bales of the finest fabric, crates of exotic drinks, sack of gold coins, and baskets of sweet-smelling delicacies pulled into Njide's family compound. The sight of such wealth made Njide's heart leap with joy. Her eyes sparkled as she danced around with excitement, her laughter ringing through the air like music. At that moment, she felt on top of the world. Her dreams of a lavish life were no longer just dreams. They were now her reality. Their marriage was a grand event, the kind the villagers would talk about for years to come. The entire village gathered to witness the union, marveling at the sheer extravagance of the celebration. Tables overflowed with assorted foods, goat meat, spicy jollof rice, fresh fish, and steaming yam porridge. There were barrels of palm wine and bottles of imported drinks. The music was loud and cheerful, with drummers beating their talking drums as flutists played melodies that made everyone sway. Njide and Nduka danced in the center of it all, their smiles wide and their movements full of joy. The villagers couldn't stop whispering among themselves. So, Njide finally got what she wanted, they murmured. She's so beautiful and her husband is rich. Look at those gifts. Who wouldn't want to be in her shoes? After the marriage, Njide moved in with her husband. She had everything she ever wanted. Njide was Nduka's third wife, but she didn't mind. In fact, she took pride in being the youngest and most cherished of them all. Nduka showered her with attention and affection, treating her like the queen she believed she was. He bought her beautiful clothes, made of the finest silk, 
adorned her with glittering jewelry and ensured that she had servants to cater to her every need. Wherever Njide went, heads turned and people admired her beauty. Compliments flowed freely and her confidence soared. Nduka himself adored Njide deeply. He never allowed her near the farm or even lifted a finger. Just always look good for me, he would always say to her. He spent more time with her than his other wives, often retreating to his private chambers to share meals and laughter with her alone. Whatever Njide wanted, Nduka gave without hesitation. It seemed as though he could deny her nothing. The other wives, who had once been the center of Nduka's world, watched in silence, their hearts heavy with jealousy. They whispered among themselves, lamenting how much had changed since Njide arrived. He barely notices us anymore, they grumbled. It's always Njide this, Njide that. But no one dared voice their complaints aloud. Nduka was a man of power and his temper was feared. The wives swallowed their bitterness, putting on forced smiles while secretly resenting the woman who had stolen their husband's attention. For Njide, however, life was perfect. She basked in the wealth, love and admiration that surrounded her, believing she had secured the happiness she had always dreamed of. A few months after their grand marriage, Njide became pregnant. The news filled the household with excitement, especially for Nduka, who couldn't contain his joy. The moment Njide told him she was expecting, Nduka made it his mission to ensure her comfort. He forbade her from doing any strenuous work and surrounded her with care. Mates attended to her every need and she was pampered like a queen throughout the pregnancy. When the time came, Njide gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. Nduka was overjoyed as he held the tiny child in his arms for the first time. They named her Chioma, which means good fortune. It was a name full of hope and promise. The villagers celebrated with the family and once again, whispers of Njide's good luck filled the air. A few years later, Njide had another baby girl, whom they named Oge. Nduka's happiness only grew with the arrival of each child, and he showered his wife and daughters with unconditional love. For over 10 years, life remained as beautiful as a dream for Njide. Nduka treated her with the same devotion as when they were newly married. He continued to spoil her with gifts, giving her the best of everything while the other wives watched from their hearts, their faces filled with longing and quiet envy. Though Nduka cared for his other wives and children, it was clear that Njide and her daughters were the center of his world. Njide basked in the attention, living the luxurious life she had always wanted. She never imagined anything could go wrong. But one day, tragedy struck. Nduka fell ill. At first, it seemed like nothing serious, a minor sickness that would pass in a few days. The household carried on, believing he would soon recover. But as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, it became clear that Nduka's condition was not improving. His strength faded and the once vibrant man was now confined to his bed. The family's fortune began to dwindle as doctors, herbalists, and medicines drained their resources. Njide's happiness turned to frustration. She was no longer the cheerful, doted upon wife. Instead, she grew resentful, watching the wealth she had once enjoyed slip away. With every passing day, her anger deepened. He's going to spend everything he has before he dies. She complained bitterly to herself whenever she sat alone. How am I supposed to survive with my children after all of this? This is not the life I signed up for. 
Nduka, weakened and bedridden, longed for the comfort of his favorite wife. He would call for Njide, hoping to see her face, but she refused to come. Her maids had long left, as there was no money left to pay them, and Njide would not lift a finger to even care for him or cook for him. I didn't come here to suffer. I never signed up to be a nanny, she snapped, when Nduka's first wife, Iko, approached her. Iko had been tirelessly caring for Nduka, but he keeps on asking to see Njide. Njide's response was cold and unforgiving. If he wants to spend the last of his money before he dies, let him do that without me, she said harshly. Tell him I don't want to see him. With that, she stomped back into her hut, slamming the door behind her. Iko stood there, shocked. She couldn't believe the words she had just heard. This was the woman who had been the center of Nduka's world, the wife he loved more than anything. Yet, here she was, showing no concern for whether he lived or died. All she seemed to care about was the money. Shaking her head, Iko muttered to herself, Nduka is getting exactly what he deserves. It's been over a year now and Nduka's condition was getting no better. Every day he called Njide's name, his voice weak and full of longing, but she never came. He died a sad and broken man, his heart heavy with disappointment. By the time of his death, there was no money left. Everything had been spent in the desperate attempts to save him. The only thing that remained were the farmlands, which were divided among his three wives. Each woman was left to cultivate the land and fend for her children. For Njide, the reality was devastating. This was not the life she had envisioned when she married Nduka. She had dreamed of endless riches and ease, not of struggling to survive. As she stared at the farmland that was now her only source of livelihood, she realized too late that her greed and pride had led her to a place she never wanted to be. The life she thought she had secured slipped through her fingers, leaving her with nothing but regret. At first, Njide stubbornly refused to cultivate the land that was left to her. The thought of bending her back to till the soil was unbearable. Her anger consumed her, growing stronger each day. As she sat in her hut, sulking and seething, she replayed the life she had dreamed of and compared it to the one she now lived. It was a cruel contrast. This life, filled with struggle and hardship, was nothing like the luxurious existence Karo, Odogu's wife, had enjoyed. Even after Odogu's death, Haro was left with plenty of money, living comfortably. That man, Nduka, is so wicked and selfish, Njide muttered to herself as she sat alone, her voice trembling with bitterness. She'd have just died when the sickness started, but no, he had to live long enough to waste everything. She would hiss loudly, clenching her fist in frustration. Meanwhile, Nduka's other wives, Iko and Uju, had moved on. They accepted their new reality and worked tirelessly on their portions of the farmland to feed their children and rebuild their lives. But Njide, consumed by her pride and anger, refused to step outside and join them. She stayed in her hut, sulking and stewing in bitterness. Hunger, however, is a relentless visitor. It crept into her home and began gnawing at her and her children. The once plentiful meals were no more. And Njide was forced to begin to sell her beautiful clothes and glittering jewelry, piece by piece to buy food. At first, it seemed like she might manage, but soon there was nothing left to sell. Hunger became a constant companion and desperation began to sink in. Njide turned to her co-wives for help, but they would not give her food or money. After all, 
she had isolated herself and treated them with disdain for years. Now, with nowhere else to turn, Njide was left with no choice. Swallowing her pride, she dragged herself out of the huts and began working on her portion of the farmland. The work was backbreaking and exhausting. For someone who had lived a life of ease, this new reality was almost unbearable. As the months passed, life wore Njide down. She became a shadow of the vibrant woman she once was. Bitterness hardened her heart, and she grew into an angry, quarrelsome woman. She would lash at anyone who crossed her path, picking fights over the smallest things with everyone. In her mind, life had cheated her, snatching away the dreams she once held so dearly. Her children, Choma and Oge, bore the brunt of her frustration. Their home, unlike the lively huts of the other wives, felt like a graveyard. Silent except for the sound of Njide's angry voice. She would scold and shout at them for the tiniest mistake, calling them names and punishing them harshly for things they didn't even understand. The love and warmth they longed for were nowhere to be found. Instead, they received beatings and bitter words that left scars deeper than any wound. Choma and Ogi worked tirelessly on the farm. They helped out with house chores like cooking, fetching water and firewood, always doing their best to ease their mother's burden, but nothing they did ever seemed to please her. They watched from a distance as the other wives and their children laughed together, their homes filled with love and companionship. In contrast, Njide's heart was a place of anger and sorrow, and the children felt trapped in a world of loneliness. Every evening, under the large mango tree in the compound, the other children would gather, sharing stories and laughing. Oge and Choma would sit nearby, longing to join them, but they didn't dare. Njide had forbidden them from speaking to their step-siblings or stepmothers. Do not even exchange a word of greeting with them, she warned, holding out her ears as if daring them to disobey. Her threats kept them away, but the longing in their hearts never faded. Chioma, the older of the two, couldn't understand why their mother was so full of anger and hatred. Despite Njide's warnings, Chioma would sneak in a greeting to her step-siblings whenever her mother wasn't looking. Her kindness made her stand out among her children. And she secretly dreamed of a life where she and her sister could play freely with the others. School was their only escape. The free village school offered them a chance to leave the gloom of their home and experience a world beyond their mother's bitterness. In school, they could laugh, learn, and for a few hours forgetting the pain of their reality. But as the school day ended, they always had to return to the suffocating atmosphere of their home, where Njide's anger awaited them. Years passed like the wind, and before long, Njide and Choma grew into breathtaking young maidens. Their beauty was impossible to ignore. Their dark, glowing skin shimmering like polished ebony and their graceful movements captivated everyone who saw them villagers would often stop in their tracks turning to steal a second glance or even third glance as the sisters walked by compliments about their beauty became a daily occurrence and although the girls would blush and respond with shy smiles their mother njide beamed with pride it wasn't long before suitors began arriving at their home, eager to ask for the hands of the stunning sisters in marriage. Young men from within the village and even beyond came in droves, bearing gifts and palm wine, hoping to win the favor of Njide and her daughters. For Choma and Oge, their tension was overwhelming but exciting. They dreamed of starting their own families, moving out of their mother's oppressive home 
and finally finding happiness. But Njide had her own plans. Seeing her daughters blossom into such beauties sparked an idea in her mind. To her, this was her golden ticket, her chance to finally escape the hardship and bitterness of her life. If Choma and Oge could marry wealthy men, Njide was sure her own life would change for the better. She imagined the gifts and the money her daughters would send her once they married into rich families. At last, she could live the luxurious lifestyle she had always craved. A life of comfort, fine clothes and servants to wait on her. Determined to make her dream a reality, Njide took control. She became the ultimate gatekeeper allowing no suitor to come near her daughters unless they met her high standards. Like a lion guarding her territory, Njide would sit on a stool in the compound, her sharp eyes darting to every man who entered. She interrogated them relentlessly, her voice cutting through the air like a whip. What do you do for a living? How much money do you make? How many cars do you even own? How many houses have you built? She would demand, her face hard and unyielding. If a suitor failed to meet her expectations, Njide wouldn't just dismiss him. She would chase him out of the compound, brandishing a stick and shouting insults so harsh that the poor man would leave, questioning his words. Get out of here, you useless man, she would scream. Do you think my daughters are meant for poverty-stricken fools like you? Choma and Oge, however, had no say in the matter. It was their future at stake, but Njide treated it as her own. The girls would sit quietly in front of their hearts, tears streaming down their faces, wishing for the freedom to choose their own husbands. They longed to escape their mother's iron grip to build their own lives away from the bitterness that filled their home. But Njide wouldn't hear of it. She was in charge, and her daughters had no choice but to obey. As word of Njide's harshness spread, fewer and fewer suitors came. Young men, who had once admired Choma and Oge from afar, now avoided their home entirely, unwilling to face Njide's wrath. Before long, the sisters were left without any proposals. The once busy compound grew quiet, and Choma and Oge began to feel the weight of their mother's actions. The girls became deeply worried. All around them, their peers were getting married, starting families and moving forward with their lives. Meanwhile, they remained single, stuck in their mother's shadow. The villagers began to whisper and point whenever the sisters passed by, mocking them for still being unmarried. Look at them, they would say, so beautiful, yet no man will go near them because of that evil mother of theirs. One night, Chuma couldn't take it anymore. She decided to confront her mother, hoping that Njide would finally understand their pain. Mama, she began carefully, as they sat outside under the moonlight. Please, allow us to choose our own husbands. We don't want to live like this anymore. But before she could stay more, Njide's face darkened with anger. Chioma, I have always known you are a foolish child, she shouted, her voice sharp and cold. Oh, so you want to bring a poverty-stricken man into this house? Eh? You want me to keep suffering? Why you live like a beggar? The gods will not allow it. No poor man will marry my daughters. Never. Try me and I will cut his legs off before he steps his foot into this compound. Choma sat in silence, her heart sinking. She realized that there was no reasoning with her mother. The conversation ended there, leaving Choma more hopeless than ever. But Ogi, the younger sister, began to see things differently. Slowly, she started to agree with her mother's dream of marrying into wealth. The idea of living a life of luxury, like the one Njide always talked about, appealed to her. 
Oge became just as selective as her mother, turning her nose up at potential suitors and carrying herself with so much pride that even the bravest men were afraid to approach her. She grew closer to Njide, and together they would sit and talk about the future. Njide would reassure her, saying, Don't worry, my daughter. Your prince charming will come soon. You will find your own Odogu. It was during these moments, dreaming of wealth and success, that Njide would smile, a rest sight in a home otherwise filled with tension. While Oge embraced her mother's idea, Chema continued to feel trapped, longing for a simple life where she could just be happy. One cold evening, as the sun dipped low and painted the sky in hues of orange and gold, Chema was returning from the farm with a basket of yams placed carefully on her head. Her thoughts were far away, but her steps were steady as she walked down the quiet path leading back to the village. Suddenly, she noticed a young man walking towards her from the opposite direction. He was tall, with broad shoulders and a handsome face. His warm smile lighting up the fading evening light. Choma had never seen him before in the village, but she greeted him politely, her soft smile adding a touch of warmth to her words. The young man stopped in his tracks, captivated by the beauty standing before him. Her smooth skin glistened with a slight sheen from her work on the farm, and her large curious eyes seemed to hold the light of the setting sun. He was speechless for a moment, then quickly recovered. Good evening, he said, his voice gentle yet firm. My name is Azubike. Choma nodded politely. Good evening, Azubike. I'm Choma, she replied, her voice calm and steady. Azubike, who had been returning from the forest after setting traps for small game, couldn't take his eyes off her. He noticed the heavy basket on her head and immediately offered to help. Let me carry that for you, he said, stepping closer. Choma hesitated, smiling shyly. Thank you, but I can manage. But... Azubike insisted, gently taking the basket from her and balancing it on his strong arms. I insist, it's no trouble at all, he said with a reassuring smile. As they walked together towards the village, they began to talk. Azubike shared bits of his life story and Choma listened with growing curiosity. He told her that he had grown up in another village with his aunt who had always wanted him to live with her. When he became a young man, he traveled to the city to work as an apprentice, learning a trade under a harsh and greedy master. After years of hard work, his master had refused to settle him properly, leaving Azubike with nothing but disappointment and frustration. It was a dark time. Azubike admitted his voice low. I thought my life was finally coming together, but it all fell apart. So, I returned to the village to start over. Chema felt her heart ache as she listened to his story. I'm so sorry, she said softly, her voice filled with sympathy. I can't even imagine how hard that must have been for you. It's terrible how some people can be so cruel. Azubike gave a small hopeful smile. It's fine, he said. I'm making new plans now, and I'm praying they work out. Enough about me, though. Tell me about yourself. Chama laughed lightly. It sounded so soft and sweet that it warmed Azubike's heart. There's really nothing much to say about me, she said modestly. I am Choma, the daughter of the late Nduka. My mother was his third wife. Azubike's expression suddenly changed and he burst into laughter, catching Choma completely off guard. She stopped walking and turned, her eyebrows furrowed in confusion. What's so funny? she asked, tilting her head. Azubike quickly waved his hand, trying to stifle his laughter. I'm sorry, he said, his eyes twinkling with amusement. It's just, my mother told me stories about your mother 
chasing away your suitors with sticks. It sounded so funny at the time, but I never imagined I would actually meet you one day. He paused, smiling. Now I see why she's so protective. You're incredibly beautiful. Gemma's smile faded and her face turned serious. Her heart sank as she realized how far her mother's antics had traveled. The thought of being a laughing stock made her feel small and exposed. I didn't mean to upset you, Azubike said quickly, noticing the sadness in her eyes. I'm truly sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. In fact, he added with a playful grin, if I were your mother, I would probably use more than a stick to keep the suitors away. You are worth protecting. His attempt to lighten the mood worked, and Chema couldn't help but smile. You're just trying to make me feel better, she said, shaking her head. But honestly, I don't blame anyone who thinks my mother is crazy. Sometimes, I think the same thing. It's not the villagers' fault. They both burst into laughter, the sound echoing through the quiet parts as they continued their work. For the first time in a long while, Chema felt a spark of happiness. As they approached the village, their conversation flowed easily, like old friends reconnecting, and Azubike couldn't help but think that meeting Chema was the best thing that happened to him since he returned home. That was how Azubike and Chema's friendship blossomed into something extraordinary. Azubike, despite the challenges he faced, walked tirelessly alongside his father on the farm. He was determined to save enough money to return to the city and start his own business. Every evening, after a long day of labor, he would make his way to the big Udara tree at the edge of the village. There, Chema would be waiting for him, her radiant smile lighting up his tired soul. Under the shade of the tree, they would sit and talk, sharing stories and dreams that stretched far beyond the boundaries of their village. Azubike had a way with words, weaving tales that made Chema laugh until tears streamed down her face. He was kind, patient, and respectful, and Chema found herself drawn to him in ways she couldn't explain. They quickly became inseparable, finding comfort and joy in each other's company. It wasn't long before their friendship deepened into something more. For Chema, Azubike was everything she had ever dreamed of in a man. He was handsome and tall, with a quiet strength that made her feel safe. But it was his heart that captured her completely. Azubike always put her happiness first, and the way he looked at her made her feel like the most important person in the world. The villagers soon began to gossip about the pair whispering about how close they had become but neither azubike nor choma paid any attention they had found something special and that was all that mattered one warm evening as the stars began to twinkle in the darkened sky azubike and choma sat under the udara tree enjoying the stillness of the night but something felt different Azubike seemed quieter than usual, and Choma noticed the way he kept glancing at her, as if searching for the right words to say. Finally, he took a deep breath and turned to her, his gaze locking with hers. Choma, he began, his voice soft but steady. I've been trying to fight this feeling for a long time, but I can't anymore. The truth is, I fell in love with you the very first day I saw you. From that moment, I knew you were special, but he hesitated, his eyes clouding with worry. I know I don't have the kind of money your mother wants for you. That's why I've been too scared to tell you how I feel. I didn't want to hurt you, but even if I can't marry you, I need you to know this. I love you, Chioma. I love you so much. Chema's heart swelled with emotion. 
Tears glistened in her eyes as she looked back at him, her lips trembling. She didn't need to think about her response. She already knew how she felt. Without saying a word, she leaned forward and wrapped her arms around him, holding him tightly. I love you too, Azubike, she whispered through her tears. I love you so much and I don't care about my mother or her craziness. All I know is that I want to be with you. Azubike held her close, his arms strong and steady around her. I know I can't stay poor forever, he said with determination. I'm working hard every day because I want to give you the life you deserve. I want you to be happy, Chioma. I want to make your mother proud too, even if it seems impossible now. I know, Chema replied, her voice barely audible, as she rested her head against his chest. I believe in you, Azubike. I know you will make it. The two of them sat under the tree, wrapped in each other's arms, their hearts full of love but heavy with the challenges ahead. They knew their love wouldn't be easy. Facing Njide, the woman who had made this clear that only the wealthiest man could marry her daughter, felt like an impossible battle. But in that moment, as they held each other beneath the vast night sky, they found strength in their bond. That evening, they stayed longer than usual, whispering about their dreams and their fears, about the life they wished to build together. As the stars shone above them, they made a silent promise to fight for their love. No matter how difficult the path might be, but deep down, they couldn't ignore the looming question. How would they face Njide, the one person who had the power to tear them apart? Meanwhile, Ogi, Chema's younger sister, seemed to have stumbled upon a stroke of luck that felt like a dream come true. One bright afternoon, a wealthy young man named Tobi, who had recently returned from the city to find a wife, was driving along the village road when he saw Ogi walking with a basket of vegetables. She was returning from the market. Her beauty was so radiant that it stopped him in his tracks. He couldn't take his eyes off her. Her smooth skin glowed under the sunlight and her graceful walk was impossible to ignore. Tobi knew instantly that he couldn't let her pass by without speaking to her. Hello, princess, he called out warmly, stepping out of his car with a confident smile. A beauty like you shouldn't be walking under the sun like this. I can't let you harm that milky skin of yours. Would you mind if I gave you a ride? Chema turned to face him, her eyes lighting up with curiosity. She flashed him a dazzling smile, one so captivating that it nearly took his breath away. Tobi felt his heart skip a bit. He knew without a doubt that he had just found the woman he wanted to marry. Without saying a word, Oge nodded and climbed into his shiny car, her mind racing with excitement. As they drove, Tobi asked her questions, his tone gentle but filled with genuine interest. What's your name? Do you live nearby? What do you do in the village? He asked eager to learn more about her. Oge answered him politely, her voice soft and sweet, but her sharp eyes were busy scanning him. She noticed his designer outfits, his expensive wristwatch and the two sleek phones sitting on the dashboard. This man screamed wealth and her heart soared. This is exactly the kind of man Mama always wanted for us, she thought, holding back the urge to scream her excitement too loudly. Tobe soon pulled up in front of their compound and parked the car. As Ogi prepared to step out, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a bundle of crisp Naira notes. Here, he said with a smile, handing her the money. I didn't get the chance to buy you anything because I didn't know I would meet someone so special today. Use this to get yourself whatever you want. I'll come by tomorrow to see you again. Ogi stared at the money in disbelief. 
She had never held such a large sum in her life. Thank you so much, she said, her voice trembling with gratitude. Toby smiled again, waved and drove off, leaving a cloud of dust behind him. As soon as his car disappeared, Oge dashed into the compound, her excitement bubbling over. Mama! 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 She shouted, her voice echoing across the yard as she waved the bundle of money in the air. Njide, hearing her daughter's excited screams, rushed out of the hut. What is it, my daughter? She asked, her eyes wide with curiosity. When she saw the money in Oge's hand, her jaw dropped. What happened? Where did you get all this money? She asked, her voice trembling with excitement. She won't believe it, Mama, Oge exclaimed, her face glowing with joy. She quickly recounted her encounter with Toby, explaining how he had given her the money and promised to come visit again the next day. Njide clapped her hands together and giggled like a child. Come, my daughter, come and tell me everything about him, she said, pulling Oge into the hut. As Oge described how rich Toby looked, Njide's face lit up with pride. Finally, my daughter has caught a big fish, she declared, her excitement spilling. You must behave yourself, Oge, so that he will marry you. Don't do anything to scare him away, she cautioned, her tone serious. Oge nodded eagerly, determined to follow her mother's advice. The next day, Tobe returned as promised, this time bringing gifts, boxes of clothes, shoes and jewelry. Njide and Oge were over the moon. This one is my in-law, Njide exclaimed not bothering to ask what Tobi did for a living. His wealth spoke for itself, and that was all that mattered to her. Tobi continued visiting Ogi every day, taking her out in his flashy car and showering her with gifts. He treated her like a queen, and Ogi basked in the attention, her heart set on becoming his wife. But not everyone was happy. Chema watched everything unfold from a distance, her heart heavy with unease. Something about Tobi didn't sit right with her. He was undeniably handsome, and his wealth was dazzling. But the rumors surrounding him made her wary. She had heard the whispers in the village that Tobi had only left the village two months ago without even a bicycle. Yet, he already returned driving an expensive car, carrying a briefcase full of money around and spraying money wherever he went to. He was also planning to build a big mansion in the village. To Choma, it all seemed too good to be true. One evening, Choma decided to speak to her sister, Oge. Oge, she said gently, I think you should ask to be what he does for a living. His sudden wealth doesn't make sense to me. Please, just be careful. Don't let Mama mislead you. But Oge didn't take it well. She glared at Choma and snapped. Why are you so negative? You are just jealous because I've found someone rich and you haven't. The words stung, but Choma tried to reason with her. Unfortunately, Oge ran to their mother and told her everything Choma had said. Njide was furious. Did that try to ruin your sister's happiness? Njide yelled, her voice sharp with anger. Who are you to question her? Do you want us to continue suffering? Foolish girl. You're not ashamed of yourself that your younger sister found a man before you. Don't even allow me to come for you. Choma fell silent, her heart heavy with sadness. She watched helplessly as Oge and Njide celebrated Tobi's attention, blind to the red flags that were so clear to see. For Choma, the situation felt like a volcano waiting to erupt, but she could do nothing to stop it. A few weeks later, the long-awaited day arrived. Oge got married to Tobi in a grand and elaborate ceremony that became the talk of the village. Njide was over the moon with joy. For her, this wedding was a victory. 
a ticket out of poverty. Her dreams of wealth and luxury seemed closer than ever, and she proudly soaked in the admiration of the village. The compound was alive with celebration, the air filled with mouth-watering aroma of assorted food. The sound of drums and flutes filled the air as dancers swayed to the beat and laughter echoed through the crowd. Ogi and Tobi were the center of attention, dancing with wild smiles as the villagers cheered them on. Njide watched the couple with pride in her eyes. Her heart swelled as she imagined Ogi living the kind of luxurious life she had always dreamed of. The villagers whispered among themselves, admiring Tobi's wealth and good looks, and Njide basked in their praises. After the wedding, Oge left for the city with her new husband. She returned occasionally to visit Njide, each time bringing gifts and money. Njide's life grew a little more comfortable and she couldn't stop boasting to the villagers about her daughter's good fortune. Meanwhile, Choma and Azubike's love continued to flourish. Their bond had only grown stronger and with Oge now married, Azubike decided it was time to take the next step. He knew he had to face Njide, Choma's mother, and formally express his intentions to marry her daughter. He was nervous but determined knowing how much Choma meant to him. Choma, however, couldn't shake the worry in her heart. She knew her mother all too well. Njide cared about wealth and status above all else. Choma also knew that while Azubike was hardworking and kind, he didn't meet her mother's material expectations. That night, Choma lay in bed unable to sleep. She prayed silently, asking the gods to soften her mother's heart. The next afternoon, Azubike arrived dressed neatly and carrying a keg of fresh palm wine and a carefully wrapped piece of bushmeat. His heart pounded as he stepped into the compound where Njide was sitting outside her hut. He greeted her politely, bowing slightly out of respect. Njide barely glanced at him. Her sharp eyes scanned him from head to toe, her expression cold and dismissive. Azubike, who had always been confident, suddenly felt a wave of nervousness. The air seemed heavy and he realized just how intimidating Njide could be. Good afternoon, Mama, he said again, forcing a smile. I brought this for you. Njide raised an eyebrow, her lips coiling into a snare. She didn't acknowledge the gifts or his greeting. Instead, she leaned forward, narrowing her eyes. And how may I help you? she asked, her tone dripping with disdain. Choma came out at that instant with a cheer, welcoming him as she flashed him a smile, which helped him relax a bit. She left the both of them, hoping everything would go well. Asubike swallowed hard but managed to keep his voice steady. Mama, I've come to tell you how I feel about your daughter. I love Choma very much, he began, trying to sound confident. I want to marry her and build a life with her. Jide's eyes widened slightly. Then, a mocking smile spread across her face. Did I hear you say you love my daughter? She asked, her voice filled with sarcasm. She stood up and craned her neck, pretending to search for something. Where did you pack your car? I can't see it anywhere. As we became froze, his confidence I, 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 I don't have a car yet, Mama, he stammered. Njide burst into a loud mocking laughter. No car? Not even a bicycle? Do you know how many cars men your age should have by now? Five or even ten? All expensive, of course. Yet you are here walking into my compound with these two drumstick legs, claiming you want to marry my daughter. Are you mad? Did they tell you I entertain mad people here? Azubike's face turned red with embarrassment. 
He tried to explain himself. Mama, I have plans. I'm working hard and I... Plants! Plants! Njide cut him off with a thunderous voice. Plan kill you there. In fact, may the gods strike that mouth of yours with thunder. Will plants buy me clothes? Will plants buy me jewelry? Will it take care of Choma? She pointed at the bush meat he had brought. And what is this? Bush. Bush meat, Mama, Azubike replied, his voice shaky. Njide hissed loudly. Wonders shall never end. Look at this one. You don't even know your place. Suitors come here with expensive things like gold, silver, expensive clothes. And you bring me meat? Did they tell you I'm a dog? I don't blame you. I blame that useless daughter of mine. For allowing a riffraff like you think you have a chance. Mama, please, Azubike tried again. But Njide caught him off with a shout. I'm done. Get out of my compound. Take your useless palm wine and meat with you. Before I count to three, disappear or I will deal with you myself. One. Two. Azubike didn't wait for her to reach three. He grabbed his things and bolted out of the compound, his heart heavy with shame and disappointment as he ran. Choma, who had been watching the scene from the corner, ran after him, tears streaming down her face. She felt helpless and angry at her mother, but she didn't know what to do. Njide sat back with a satisfied look on her face, muttering, These poor boys think they can't fool me, not in this lifetime. I can't allow Choma to disgrace me like this. Azubike. Azubike, Choma called out, her voice breaking as she ran after him. Her feet pounded against the dusty village path, her heart raising faster with every step. She finally caught up to him, standing still by the side of the road. His shoulders slumped. His face was a mix of embarrassment and anger. But as he turned to look at her tear streaked face, his expression softened. I'm sorry, Choma, Azubike said quietly, his voice heavy with sadness. This, this was more than I expected. I didn't think it would be this bad. Choma's chest tightened. Her worst fear was playing out before her eyes. What are you saying, Azubike? she asked. Her voice trembling as fresh tears rolled down her cheeks. Are you giving up on us? Are you leaving me? Azubike shook his head slowly, his own eyes glistening with unshed tears. Choma, you know I love you. I have always loved you. But it's not my fault that life didn't go the way I planned. I'm not lazy. If only my master in the city had settled me properly after my apprenticeship, things wouldn't have been different. I served him with all my heart, and I never stole a single cobble from him. But now, he paused, his voice cracking. Now I'm here, struggling to raise money to start something for myself. I'm working so hard, Choma, but these things take time. They are not magic, and your mother, he sighed deeply. She would never accept someone like me. You should have seen the way she looked at me today, as if I wasn't even human. Choma stepped closer, her voice desperate. Then, let's run away, Azubike, she said, clutching his arm. Let's go far from here, to a place where we can start afresh. We can build our life together at our own pace. You can come back later when things are better and pay my bride price. Then, Mama will have no choice but to accept you. For a moment, Azubike was silent. He looked at her with a pained expression, as if torn between love and duty. Finally, he shook his head. Choma, you deserve better than that. I can't do that to you or your family. I am poor, 
yes, but I'm a man of integrity. Running away would be wrong. If I take you without your mother's blessing, I will feel like I failed you, like I failed myself. Then, as if a string of hope came into him, he said, Please, if you love me, just give me time. A few years, that's all I need. I will work hard, so hard, and I will come back for you. By then, I will have the means to win your mother's approval. Chema's voice wavered. Where will you go, Azubike? How will you start over? He took a deep breath, trying to steady himself. I will go back to the city, he said firmly. I have a little money saved. Not much, but it's something. I will use it to start small and I will hustle hard. Believe me, Choma. Just wait for me, please. Choma's tears peeled over as she threw her arms around him, holding him tightly. She rested her head against his chest, listening to the steady beat of his heart. I will wait for you, Azubike, she whispered through her sobs. I will wait as long as it takes. Azubike wrapped his arms around her, his own heart breaking at the thoughts of leaving her. Thank you, he said softly. Thank you for believing in me. The two lovers stood there, locked in each other's embrace, their emotions raw and their hearts aching. The thought of being apart felt unbearable, but they both knew it was the only way forward. Azubike had to leave. The city was his only chance to build a future, not just for himself, but for Chioma as well. As the sun dipped lower on the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, Chioma finally let him go. She watched as he turned and began walking away, his figure growing smaller with every step. Tears blurred her vision, but she stood there, rooted to the spot, silently praying for his success. Azubike too felt the weight of the moment. Every step he took felt like a knife cutting deeper into his heart. He clenched his fists, determined. He would not fail Chioma. The city held hope and he would chase it with everything he had. For her, for their love, for their future. Life became unbearable for Chioma after Azubike left for the city. With him gone, she felt like the only person who truly cared for her had disappeared. But the worst of it came from her mother Njide, who seemed to pour all her anger and disappointment onto her. Njide never missed an opportunity to remind Choma of her single status, mocking her relentlessly and comparing her to her younger sister Oge. Shameless girl, Njide would yell, her voice sharp like a whip. Look at your sister, see how she glows, how she takes care of me and you. You want to marry that useless riffraff, Azubike. You are a disgrace to me. I wish I never gave birth to you. What did I do to deserve such shame for a daughter? Every time Oge visited from the city, it only made things worse. Oge would arrive in a flashy car, stepping out dressed in the finest clothes, her face glowing with confidence. Njide would order Chioma to cook and serve her younger sister, often making snide remarks as she did. Why should I serve her? Choma had once dared to ask, but Njide had exploded in anger. Because she's not useless like you. Because she married a rich man and takes care of me, unlike you, a failure. Oge never came to Choma's defense. Instead, she seemed to enjoy her sister's humiliation. Mama is right, Oge would say smugly, taking a sip of her juice. Choma, you will never understand what Mama is saying until you marry a rich man. Look at me now. Classy chick. My husband takes care of me, pampers me, and spoils me every day. That car there. It's the smallest of my car. 
Oh, I'm so blessed. Her words were always laced with mockery, meant to make Chema feel small. Chema would sit under the tree, swallowing her pride and holding back tears, watching her mother and sister, devouring the chicken and juice Oge had brought from the city. This is so sweet, Njide would exclaim, licking her fingers. You people are really enjoying in the city. Mama, eat as much as you want, Oge would reply. Smirking at her sister, there's plenty more where this came from. My husband is endless. Not once did they invite Choma to join them, but she endured. She kept quiet, hiding her pain behind a stoic expression. At night, she would pray fervently to the gods, asking for blessings for Azubike. She had no idea how he was faring in the city, but she clung to hope, believing that he was working hard and that one day he would return for her. Two years had passed, yet there was no word from Azubike. Not a letter, a message, nothing. Even his family had not heard from him. The silence was suffocating, and for Choma, the pressure grew worse with each passing day. Old fool, Njide would scream at her daily. You are still here. Go and get a husband. You won't disgrace me in this village. Look at your mates, they are all married. Even your sister now has a child. But you, you are an abomination. Chema felt like she was drowning. The weight of her mother's words pressed down on her, suffocating her spirit. She had begged Oge to let her come to the city, hoping for some relief from the constant torments, but Oge had dismissed her coldly. You need to find yourself a husband and stay with him. That's what your mates are doing, she said bluntly, refusing to help. With no other option, Chuma remained at home, stuck in the endless cycle of her mother's anger and disappointment. She took on all the household chores now that Oge was gone. Cooking, fetching water, going to the farm. But no matter how hard she worked, it was never enough for Njide. You are useless, she would shout, her voice echoing through the compound. Nothing you do will ever amount to anything. I should have thrown you into the river when you were born. Chema's heart broke a little more each day. She felt trapped, her spirit crushed by the weight of her mother's words and the uncertainty of her future. Azubike's absence left a void in her life, and the relentless abuse from her mother made her question if she could ever find happiness again. But despite the pain, Chema clung to the one thing that kept her going, hope. Hope that Azubike would return. Hope that her prayers would be answered. Hope that her life one day would change. One sunny afternoon. Njide returned from the market with a large basket brimming with foodstuffs, yams, vegetables, dried fish and spices. Her face glowed with joy and her steps were unusually light. As she walked into the compound, she began singing and dancing, clearly in high spirits. Choma, who was peeling cassava in the corner, looked up in surprise. Choma, my daughter, Njide called out with a wide grin. The gods have finally heard our prayers. A wealthy man from the city is coming tomorrow to ask for your hand in marriage. Chema froze, the cassava knife slipping from her fingers. She stood up slowly, her heart pounding. What? she asked, her voice shaking with disbelief. Mama, no. I'm not getting married to anyone except Azubike. I've told you before, I am not interested. The smile on Injide's face vanished instantly. Her eyes narrowed and her expression turned cold. Look at this old cargo, she snapped angrily. We are trying to help you, and you stand there talking nonsense. Do you think you are getting any younger? You are almost 30. Soon, your face will be full of wrinkles, and you'll be sitting there like an old woman, waiting for a man, 
who is probably in the city, enjoying his life with little girls. Stop, Mama, Gemma screamed. Her voice filled with frustration and pain. I've had enough of this nonsense. What have I ever done to you? Why are you so bent on making my life miserable? Jide's jaw dropped in shock. She stared at Choma as though she couldn't believe what she was hearing. Are you talking to me like that? She asked, her voice low and dangerous. Yes, Mama. Choma shot back, tears glistening in her eyes. You drove all my suitors away, and now you blame me for being single. Azubike came here. You insulted him, humiliated him and crushed his spirit. Not even caring about how I felt. I love Azubike and I will wait for him even if I grow grey hairs waiting. If he doesn't come back, so be it. But I refuse to be your tool, Mama. Jide's face twisted with fury. <laughs> grey hairs in my own house. You must be joking. Let me tell you something, Choma. If I ever hear that riffraff's name from your mouth again, turn that will strike you where you stand. She pointed a trembling finger at her daughter. Your husband is coming tomorrow and you will marry him. You better get ready or I will make you regret the day you were born. Choma couldn't hold back her tears anymore. They streamed down her face as she turned and ran out of the compound, her mother's angry words echoing behind her. She ran and ran until she reached the familiar spot under the Udara tree, the place where she and Azubiki had spent so many happy evenings together. There, she sank to the ground, burying her face in her hands. Her heart felt heavy with pain. It had been over four years since Azubike left for the city, and still, there was no word from him. Had he forgotten about her? Was she a fool for holding onto a promise he might no longer remember? Was he enjoying life in the city with other little girls, just as her mother had said? No. Chema said aloud, shaking her head fiercely, as if to drive the thoughts away. Not my Azubike. He told me he loved me. He promised he would come back. Her friends had mocked her countless times, calling her foolish and naive, and waiting for a man who might never return. But Chema had made a promise to herself and to Azubike, and she couldn't let go of the hope that he would keep his word. Under the tree, Choma cried until the sun disappeared and the sky filled with stars. Her heart ached with doubt and longing, but she clung to the fragile thread of hope that kept her going all these years. Finally, when the night grew too cold, she stood up and wiped her tears. Her steps were heavy as she walked back home, her shoulders slumped with the weight of her sorrow. Inside, Jide was waiting, her face set still in anger. But Choma didn't care. She slipped into her room, closed the door, and lay on her mat staring at the ceiling. The next day, Jide was up early in the morning, humming a cheerful tune as she busied herself in the kitchen. Her face was glowing with excitement and her energy was contagious. Choma watched from the corner confused and surprised. It was rare to see her mother so happy. Ne, come and help me, Njide called using a pet name for Choma that she hadn't heard in years. The suitors will soon arrive. Choma's eyebrows rose in disbelief. Her mother was calling her Nne. This sudden sweetness felt foreign. Not wanting to spoil her mother's mood, she reluctantly joined her in the kitchen. The two walked in silence, the tension thick in the air, despite Njide's good spirits. Chema's mind was heavy with thoughts. Not long after, the sounds of cars approaching broke the silence. Three sleek cars pulled into the compound, their shiny exteriors reflecting the morning sun. Njide jumped out of the kitchen with her hands spread wide dancing and shouting with joy. Oh, wow, Gomo, she exclaimed, her voice filled with excitement. My in-laws are here. One by one, men began stepping out of the cars. They were young, 
handsome men dressed in fine clothes and older distinguished men who carried themselves with authority. They all looked wealthy, their presence oozing power and success. Jide's eyes sparkled as she welcomed them, offering them seats with the confidence of a proud mother. Some elders from Choma's family had been invited and they sat in a corner observing the scene quietly. Njide, however, could hardly contain her excitement, her joy nearly overwhelming her. Nne, Njide called out again as she met Choma at the kitchen. Go and dress up. I bought you a new dress and it's on my bed. They will soon ask to see you. Choma walked silently into her room, her heart heavy. The night before, she had wrestled with her thoughts, her emotions torn in different directions. It had been over four years since Azubike left for the city, and she hadn't heard a word from him, not even once. Did he still remember her? Was he still working hard to return for her? Or had he moved on, forgetting the promises they made to each other? She stared at her reflection in the mirror as she put on the dress her mother had picked out. It fits perfectly, highlighting her beauty, but she felt none of the joy she might have felt years ago. Tears slipped down her face as she whispered, Azubike, if you can hear me, save me now. A knock on the door snapped her out of her thoughts. Quickly wiping her tears, she turned to the door. Nne, they are waiting for you, Njide said sweetly, her voice unrecognizably gentle. Shema took a deep breath, trying to steady her nerves. The sugary tone from her mother only added to her unease. Slowly, she stepped out and walked towards the gathering outside. As soon as she appeared, gasps of admiration filled the air. Chai, Omalisha, one of the men exclaimed. Look how beautiful she is, so stunning. Chema forced a polite smile and greeted them, her heart pounding with a mix of anger and despair. An elder in the family stood up and pointed towards a young man sitting in the center of the group. Chief Ozoba's son is here to ask for your hand in marriage, the elder announced with pride. Chema's eyes shifted to the man in question. He was handsome with sharp features and an air of confidence. But as she looked at him, her heart remained cold. This is not who I want, she thought. I want Azubike. Then, to her shock, the young man began to laugh loudly, his shoulders shaking with amusement. Chuma's eyes widened. What's happening, she wondered. One of the older men patted the young man's shoulder, trying to calm him down. To confirm Choma's fear, the man again suddenly clapped his hands and started speaking to the air, his words incoherent and disjointed. The gathering fell into stunned silence, everyone watching him with wide eyes. Choma's heart sank as realization dawned on her. This man was not well. He was mentally unstable. Her throat tightened and tears welled up in her eyes. Is this what my mother wants for me? She thought bitterly. To marry someone like this just because his family is rich. The weight of her mother's greed and her own helplessness crushed her. Without saying a word, she turned and ran, her feet carrying her as far away from the compound as possible. Don't worry about her, Njide said quickly, trying to reassure the guest. You've seen her. She'll come around. She's just a child and doesn't know what is good for her. But Chema wasn't coming around. As she ran, her tears blurred her vision and her chest heaved with sobs. Her heart was filled with anger, despair and the overwhelming need to escape the life her mother was forcing on her. Azubike. Where are you, she thought, her mind crying out for the man who held her heart. If you love me, come back, please. Chema returned home late that night. 
her steps careful and quiet as she tried to sneak into her hut without waking her mother. The compound was dark, with only the faint glow of moonlight illuminating the pathway. Her heart pounded with exhaustion and fear as she tiptoed towards the door. But just as she reached the threshold, Jide's sharp voice cut through the silence like a long, sharp whip. Where do you think you are going? Chema froze, her heart jumping into her throat. Mama, she whispered, her voice trembling. Don't you mama me, Njide snapped, her voice filled with anger. She stepped out of the shadows, her eyes blazing with fury. Chioma, you embarrassed me. You humiliated me in front of our in-laws. Do you have any idea who they are? Do you know how wealthy and respected they are? And you just ran off like a mad woman. Chuma's throat tightened as she turned to face her mother. Tears filled her eyes, but she couldn't hold back the frustration any longer. Mama, you want me to marry a madman just because he's wealthy, she cried out, her voice breaking. How can you do this to me? Is this how much you hate me? What about my happiness? How can I live with someone like that? Jide's lips curled in disgust as she crossed her arms over her chest. That madman, as you call him, is Chief Ozoba's only son, she shouted. Do you realize what that means? Think about the wealth. Think about the money, the power you will have at your fingertips. Think about the kind of life you would live, the luxury, the comfort. Who cares about love, Choma? Love doesn't pay bills. Money is happiness. Choma shook her head, her tears streaming freely now. Mama, I can't do this, she said softly, her voice barely audible. I can't marry him. Please don't make me. But Njide was unmoved. She stepped closer, pointing an accusing finger at her daughter. If you don't marry that man, if you make us lose this golden opportunity, I swear by the gods, I will curse you. Njide's voice thundered through the compound. I will curse you, Choma. You sucked my breast. And if I lay a curse on you, you will suffer forever. Do you hear me? Your marriage is in four days. Four days. Choma's legs felt weak as the weight of her mother's words pressed down on her. She couldn't believe this was happening that her own mother would threaten her so cruelly. Unable to say another word, she turned and stumbled away, her tears blinding her as she made her way to the old mango tree at the edge of the compound. There, under the familiar branches that had once provided her with comfort and shade, Chema sank to the ground. The rough back pressed against her back as she leaned against the tree, her body trembling with sobs. Her chest felt tight, her heart heavy with despair. Her mother's words echoed in her mind. I will curse you. I will curse you. Chema buried her face in her hands, wishing she could disappear, wishing she had never been born. Why, Mama, she whispered into the darkness. Why do you hate me so much? What did I do to deserve this? She thought about her life about the love she had for Azubike and the promise they had made to each other. But Azubike was gone, and now she was trapped in a nightmare she couldn't escape. Her tears fell harder as a new wave of pain washed over her. For the first time in her life, Chema felt completely broken. Her dreams, her hopes, her happiness, all of it felt shattered beyond repair. She wrapped her arms around her knees and rocked back and forth, her cries blending with the rustling of the leaves above her. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know how to escape. Nduka's compound was beautifully decorated, its colorful fabrics draped over every corner, and fresh flowers lined the pathways. The aroma of rich delicacies, jollof rice, spicy goat meat, pepper soup, 
and fried chicken filled the air, making mouths water. Villagers gathered in excitement, shouting and laughing, their faces glowing with anticipation. This was a wedding no one in the village wanted to miss. Inside her small hut, Choma sat by the window, her swollen eyes gazing out at the cheerful crowd. Her face bore the marks of endless tears, her heart heavy with pain and regret. At this point, all she wanted was freedom. Freedom from her mother's iron grip and constant torment. Marrying her crazy groom-to-be, whose name she didn't even know, felt like her only escape. It was clear to her now. Azubike had forgotten her. He wasn't coming back and she had to move on. Maybe, she thought bitterly, I will find some kind of happiness in the city. She resolved never to return home, never to see her mother again. The money Njide was so desperate for. The money that had driven her to push Choma into marrying a madman would never reach her. Choma vowed to keep it from her mother as her final act of defiance. I will make her regret ever forcing me to marry this man. As she looked through the window, everyone outside seemed happy except her. Even her sister Oge had returned with her husband and their two children. They were laughing and chatting as if nothing else in the world mattered. Chema sighed deeply, her chest tightening with sorrow. She wiped her tears knowing it was time to dress up. Not long after, a loud commotion announced the arrival of Chief Ozoba and his family. Their convoy of cars was even grander than the first time they had visited, and the villagers stared in awe as the vehicles parked in the compound. Wealth dripped from their every move. Expensive clothing, sparkling jewelry, and confident smiles. The admiration in the crowd was palpable. Chioma, however, remained in her heart, her heart sinking further. The groom's mother entered the room where Chioma was, her expensive perfume filling the air. She was a regal-looking woman with a warm smile. She approached Chioma, her face soft with sympathy. Don't worry, my daughter, she said, patting Chioma gently on the shoulder. I know this is all overwhelming, but I promise you will never lack a single thing. We will take good care of you. Your children will be heirs to our vast empire. She paused, looking Chema over. By the way, you are so beautiful, she added with a smile before stepping out. Chema only nodded, unable to muster a response. As soon as the woman left, tears peeled freely down her cheeks. Her heart ached as she thought of what could have been. She wished she could scream to cry out to the heavens for help, but she swallowed her pain and wiped her tears. It was time to face her future. The ceremony began with vibrant music and cheers from the crowd. Gemma was called to greet her husband and his family, as tradition demanded. With trembling hands and heavy hearts, she stepped out of the hut, her face clouded with sorrow. Her movements were slow and mechanical as she danced to the soft, gentle music. It was clear to everyone watching that the bride was not happy. As she moved towards the center of the compound, a sudden commotion interrupted the ceremony. Heads turned as three sleek cars pulled into the compound, their engine pouring like lions. The doors opened, and armed bodyguards stepped out, their presence commanding respect and fear. The crowd gasped in astonishment, their moments growing louder. From the third car, a man stepped out, dressed in an expensive well-tailored attire that screamed elegance and power. His entire appearance radiated wealth, gold accessories, polished shoes, and an aura of authority. He stood tall, 
scanning the crowd until his eyes found Joma. Joma's heart leaped in her chest. Her breath caught as recognition hit her like a wave. Azubike, she screamed, her voice filled with joy and disbelief. Dropping everything, she ran towards him, her feet barely touching the ground. Tears streamed down her face as she threw herself into his open arms, holding him tightly. It felt like a dream, a dream she never wanted to wake up from. I thought you'd forgotten me, she sobbed, her tears soaking into his clothes. Azubike held her close, his arms strong and steady around her. How could I ever forget you, he said, his voice full of emotion. I gave you my word, Choma, and I'm here to take you, my love. I've worked so hard, and now I'm back for you. The crowd watched in stunned silence, their mouths agape. Even the musicians had stopped playing, their instruments dangling in their hands. All eyes turned to Njide, whose jaw hung open in disbelief. Njide couldn't believe what she was seeing. This was the same man she had insulted, humiliated and driven out of her compound years ago. Now, he stood before her, surrounded by bodyguards and dripping in wealth. Azubike had become everything she had wanted in his son-in-law and more. Her knees nearly gave way as she muttered under her breath, The gods must be playing tricks on me. The ceremony quickly descended into chaos. As the Ozoba family stormed out of the compound, their faces twisted with anger and humiliation. Chief Ozoba, his voice thunderous, turned to Njide. I've never felt so humiliated in my life, he bellowed. All the money, gifts, everything you've taken from us. You have two days to return them. If you fail, you will face my wrath. With that, he climbed into his car, slamming the door shut. The convoy of vehicles roared to life and sped away, leaving behind its stunned and silent crowd. Njide stood frozen in the middle of the compound, her body trembling. Beads of sweat formed on her forehead as her mind raced. She had spent it all. The money, the gifts, everything. She had used it to stock up the house, buy new clothes, and jewelries, and then prepare for the wedding. Now, she had nothing left. But Choma didn't care about any of it. None of it mattered to her now. Azubike was back, and he was all she could think about. Her heart felt light for the first time in years, and a wide smile played on her lips as she clung to his arm. This time, she vowed nothing would keep them apart. That evening, under the Odara tree where their love story had begun, Choma and Azubike sat together, their hands intertwined. The moonlight bathed them in its soft glow as Azubike began to share his story. When I returned to the city, he started, his voice steady but filled with emotion. Things were worse than I expected. I struggled for months trying to find my footing. I tried everything, odd jobs, selling small goods, anything to survive, but nothing worked. He paused, his gaze fixed on the ground. There were days I didn't have anything to eat, nights I slept outside. It felt hopeless. Gemma's grip on his hand tightened, her heart breaking as she listened. Then one day. I met a Chinese businessman. He was looking for someone reliable to help him with his trade. I started working for him, running errands and helping with small deals. Over time, he saw that I was trustworthy and he began to give me goods on credit to sell. That was when things changed for me. As Ubike's voice grew stronger, his eyes lighting up with pride. I worked day and night building connections and growing my business. It wasn't easy, Juma, but I never gave up. 
My love for you kept me going. I wanted to be the man you deserved. Today, I own shops in Alaba International Market, Lagos. I have built my own house in the city and my business is thriving. It was a long hard road, but I made it. I'm here now and I'm never leaving you again. Tears of joy rolled down Chema's cheeks as she wrapped her arms around him, holding him tightly. I'm so proud of you, she whispered. You've become everything I always knew you could be. A few days later, Azubike settled all the debts Njide owed the Azoba family, sparing her from their rot. Despite everything she had done, he chose to show mercy, if only for Choma's sake. Weeks later, he and Choma were married in an elaborate ceremony that the entire village would talk about for years to come. It was a true celebration of love with music, dancing and joy filling the air. The couple beamed as they danced together, finally free to live the life they had dreamed of. Njide, however, was consumed by regret. As she watched the ceremony from the sidelines, shame weighed heavily on her. She thought of how she had treated Choma, how she had insulted and humiliated Azubike, and how her greed had nearly destroyed her daughter's happiness. She couldn't believe how wrong she had been. I have been a terrible mother, she muttered to herself. Her head bowed in shame. She wasn't sure if Chema or Azubike would ever truly forgive her, but she hoped one day they might. After the wedding, Azubike and Chema returned to the city together. Their new home was beautiful, a testament to Azubike's hard work and determination. They spent their days building their life together, their love stronger than ever. One evening, as they sat by the pool, Azubike took Chema's hands in his and looked her into her eyes. I will love you until the day I stop breathing, he said, his voice soft but filled with emotion. While I was in the city alone struggling to make it, I couldn't stop thinking about you. Every time I felt like giving up, I remember the promise I made to you. I told myself I would come back as a man you could be proud of. And now, here we are. I love you more than words can say. Choma's eyes glistened with tears as she leaned in and kissed him gently. I can't love you less, she whispered, her voice trembling with emotion. You are everything to me, Azubike. In that moment, surrounded by the peace they had fought so hard to find, the couple knew their love had conquered every obstacle. They were finally home in each other's arms. Back in the village, after Choma's marriage ceremony, Oge had refused to return to the city. She stayed back with her mother while her husband returned to his people. At first, Njide thought they wanted to spend some time with her, but weeks passed and then months and she realized that something was wrong. Tobe, who used to visit the compound in his flashy car, now arrived on foot, his head hanging low. The house he had been building in the village stood incomplete, and rumors swelled that he had sold it. Jide could no longer ignore the signs. One evening, she confronted Oge while her children played in the yard. What is happening, Oge, she asked, her voice laced with suspicion. It's been three months now. I've been feeding you and your children, and even your husband comes here to eat. Where are your cars? Where is his car? And why haven't you gone back to the city? Oge sighed deeply, tears welling up in her eyes. She looked down, avoiding her mother's piercing gaze. Mama, she began, her voice trembling. We've lost everything. Tobe, he's a fraud star. He got involved in some bad business and he was caught. He was locked up and his accounts were frozen. We had to sell everything. Our cars, our house, everything to secure his bill. 
Now, we have nowhere else to go. But here, Injide let out a loud wail, throwing her hands in the air. Ewo! I am finished. Hey! What have I done to myself? She paced back and forth, her face twisted in despair. You said your husband's money could never finish. Eh, it's finished, Mama, Oge replied, her tears falling freely now. Njede sat down heavily on the stool, her hands on her head. Hey, I'm back to square one. I don't even have Chuma's contacts or her husband's. How do we survive? And we didn't even treat her well. She broke into sobs, shaking her head as regret washed over her. In the days that followed, the situation grew worse. Food became scarce and tensions rose in the small hut. The once close bond between Njide and Oge began to crumble under the weight of their misfortune. Quarrels erupted daily, filling the compound with angry voices. You must leave my house and go to your husband. Njide shouted one morning, her voice filled with frustration. I'm going nowhere, Mama, Oge shot back, her voice trembling with rage. You ruined my life. If I had listened to Choma, I wouldn't be here. That's because you are a fool, Njide spat. Look at Choma. She's such a wise girl. She knew what she wanted and she got it. Azubike is a wealthy man doing clean business in the city. While you, she pointed an accusing finger at Oge, you married a thief. Oge stared at her mother in shock, unable to believe what she was hearing. You pushed me, Mama, she cried. You supported me to marry him and you enjoyed all the stolen money with us. You encouraged me to marry Tobe. Njide sneered, waving her hands dismissively. And so what? If I told you to put your hand in fire, would you do it? You are a grown woman, Oge. Your stupidity is your own fault. Anger surged through Oge like a tidal wave. You are a witch, Mama. You are evil. You are the worst mother on earth. Njide ignored her, shaking her head dramatically. Hey! My only regret, she said, her voice rising, is that I didn't treat my wise daughter well. My angel, Ogum. Choma, my shining star. I pray she forgives me one day. Ah! Oge stared at her mother in disbelief, her chest heaving with rage and hurt. Meanwhile, in the city, Choma's life with Azubike was nothing short of blissful. He cherished her and treated her like a queen, ensuring that every day was filled with love and laughter. Their home was warm and inviting. A stark contrast to the coldness she had endured in her mother's house. Choma had decided to take a break from her mother. She needed time to heal from the years of emotional trauma Njide had inflicted on her. She knew she would eventually forgive her mother. Perhaps send her food and money from time to time. But she made up her mind never to allow Njide back into her life as a mother. She sucks at it. Choma thought bitterly. What Choma didn't know was that her fears concerning Ogi had come true. The wealth and luxury Ogi had once flaunted were all gone, replaced by hardship and despair. The sister who had mocked and belittled her now struggled to survive. Trapped in the very cycle of pain that Choma had fought so hard to escape. Hey besties, thank you so much for watching this amazing story and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it. I would love you to drop your lessons in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe if you are yet to subscribe. Please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you get notified whenever we post new stories. Please like, share this video with your family and friends. And thank you so much for all your love and your support. That means so much to me and I can't even thank you enough. Right now, I'll have to go and see you in the next story. Bye!